know, and I think the significance of my particular dream for Kona is, is I'm not a podium finisher. I am not the guy that is, you know, doing um, two hour Olympics and uh, finishing Ironman in 10, 10 and a half hours. The Triathlon Show 142. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I bring you a case study of a slightly different format than normal. I interview Ian Haken on how he plans to go from being very much a mid-packer, as he himself admits, to qualifying for Kona using a system he calls Dream, and he has also done a TEDx talk on this topic. His best iron distance time is 12 hours 18 minutes, so he has to cut roughly two hours or a bit more than two hours from that to be in with a chance of of qualifying, so it is a big mountain to climb and uh, definitely something that requires a lot of work and this DREAM, which is an acronym that he uses, is what he hopes will help him achieve that. But first, this episode is sponsored by Precision Hydration. And in the month of August, you can use the special promo code TTS20 to get 20% off your order on precisionhydration.com. Do make sure that if you haven't already, you take their free online sweat test, which I linked to in the episode description so that you know what strength of electrolytes are the best for you and your individual needs, because there's no one size fits all when it comes to hydration. And right now I'm actually sitting here with a bottle of Precision Hydration because even podcasting, Portugal is so hot at the moment. It's one of the hottest places in the world. It's been 40 plus degrees Celsius here the last few days. So even outside of training, I need to get some electrolytes in because I'm sweating so much all day long, whether I'm training, podcasting, coaching, whatever it may be. So again, to get your electrolyte needs covered go to precisionhydration.com and use that promo code tts20 to get 20 percent off your order and thank you to roca for sponsoring this episode roca makes the best wetsuits sunglasses tri suits skin suits buoyancy shorts and other similar apparel and equipment in the world you cannot find better quality it's the premium brand that uh, the top athletes in the world go to And uh, actually, one of the athletes that I personally coached recently used the discount code that I have to get himself a Maverick Pro 2 wetsuit. And after his first open water swim, that this is what he wrote in his training peaks to as a comment to the workout. Tried out the Maverick Pro 2 wetsuit, and that's next level gliding. Great gear. Thanks for the discount. Much appreciated. So if you too want that sort of next level gliding, I also use uh, use a Maverick wetsuit, so I can definitely agree with that. Or you want next level performance in general, whether it's an aerodynamic tri suit or things along those lines, head over to roca.com and use the promo code that triathlon show, all one word, all caps, to get 20% off your entire order. And before we start the interview, a quick housekeeping item as well. I just started a giveaway on scientifictriathlon.com forward slash giveaway. And there's a link in the description to this episode as well. So it has uh, some great, great, great prizes that you can win, uh, including customized training plans, coaching consultations, uh, and uh, precision hydration electrolytes, the SwimSmooth Guru Pro subscription, Exert Premium yearly subscription, Uh, Six excellent triathlon and endurance sports books that I handpicked myself. And some training plan bundles as well for a total value of uh, 3,600 euros or so. And the winner, the main winner will get a value of 850 euros or so. So there are some great prizes here and uh, I highly recommend that you check it out. I'll link to that as well in the description and it's scientifictriathlon.com forward slash giveaway. I'll talk a bit more about this giveaway after the interview with Ian, but uh, right now, let's just dive right in. All right, so today's guest on that triathlon show is uh, Ian Haken. Ian, welcome to the show. 
Thank you. It's good to be here. So this is a, a case study and you were recommended when I asked for recommended recommended guests on uh, my Facebook page. So why don't you fill us in on your background in terms of triathlon, but also what you do in your career and what your family situation looks like and where you come from? Sure. Yeah, sure. So I come from uh, the very east coast of the UK uh, in a place called Gorston, which is just south of Great Yarmouth. So right on the actual coast. So I've got beautiful sandy beaches as part of my training uh, uh, environment to take in and uh, beautiful um, uh, countryside just inland. So it's a beautiful part of the world. Uh, I um, have been doing triathlons for about 11 years now i started off just um wanted to get a bit fit actually i think it was about a couple of weeks before my 39th birthday and i thought i'm going to be 40 next year i need to do something about this mid drift etc as many of us do at that sort of age and i started to do a couch to 5k that then found me doing the london marathon a year later and then uh, quite quickly i found triathlon and i've been doing it ever since so i've done uh four or five uh long distance triathlons depending on if you count uh uh Zilfinger, um uh long distance duathlon as one of those which i think you can probably count as an iron man um and uh i have loved every minute of it i'm sort of uh, addicted to the sport as many of us are uh and that journey of um self discovery that came with that in terms of looking after myself initially obviously with my physical fitness and i started to think about more about my nutrition and uh, the amount of uh, other things that you do that don't help like you know the odd beer here and there and and i started to think about how that was affecting my performance at work as well i was a ceo at the time i'm originally a chartered accountant uh, and i um uh, i've owned a couple of businesses and i was ceo of a business uh, a leisure a local leisure business good sized company and people started to notice I was showing up different. I had more energy every day, uh, which was down to uh, initially a physical fitness. And then I started to invest in my mental fitness as well and my well-being and kind of really went on a journey then. And that's what took me into my career change and to become an energy coach. So I formed my company, Yellow Brick Road, about four and a half years ago. And I've been helping other people unlock their energy um, ever since. Uh, Sorry, there's a device going off here. Um, uh. <laughs> no problem. I'm going to ask one follow-up question on uh, what you mentioned earlier, doing triathlons ever since. How long is that? How, how old are you now and, and how many years have you been doing triathlon? Yeah, I've been doing triathlon about 10 years. I'm running about 11. Okay. So so now you are uh, you're an energy coach you're a business owner and uh, what about uh, family? Yeah, I've got um uh, I'm married with three girls, two two uh, two grown-up girls from a previous relationship and one 11-year-old. So I've got the challenges of uh trying to keep a business um trying to put the hours into um, my training that we need to do to reach the goals we want to get reach and also being a father and a husband, which I know is a big challenge for lots of other um, guys and girls out there trying to keep that balance right. Um, yeah. Which... And, and in terms of your work, how how demanding is that in terms of weekly hours, for example? Um, it's full time, basically. Um, I'm, I'm working. I'm, I wouldn't say I'm uh, although I'm in startup phase because I'm launching a new product, um, I wouldn't say uh, that I'm like pushing 68 hours a week. I'm not. The uh, whole point of what I do about helping others is to make sure that they've got the right balance in life. So I, I try and adopt that approach myself. Um, I've got enough uh, income to pay the bills and uh, sustain my lifestyle uh, from my long term contracts. So uh, I pretty much do a normal working week uh, and then have to sort of fit the triathlon in around that. That's good. And uh, what about triathlon goals? Uh, that's something that we'll kind of start to focus in on and your goals and how you are going to achieve them. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So so my um, TEDx talk that I did, which, uh, which was one of the reasons we started talking, wasn't it? Um, really focused on my my dream to get to Kona. I did a talk at a TEDx locally uh, and the, the whole theme of the event was how to dream big. And I actually called my speech exactly that. And uh, 
for that reason, I was up first. And I, I, I unlocked, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, the idea of my dream to get to Kona. And I think the significance of my particular dream for Kona is, is I'm not a podium finisher. I am not the guy that is, you know, doing um, two hour Olympics and uh, finishing Ironmans in 10, 10 and a half hours um, that would kind of would be in the mix. I have the my best Ironman time, uh, Iron distance time on a challenge event was um, 11 hours and uh, 18 minutes. So, uh, sorry, 12 hours and 18 minutes, give myself an hour then. Um, so, you know, I'm nowhere near um, where you would say, uh, um, uh, there's likelihood of me qualifying without uh, a seismic shift in performance. And your age group right now, it's would would it be the fifty to fifty four? Is that correct? I'm currently in the uh, forty five to forty nine, uh, but that's the plan. Is when I step up an age group, not that it makes a whole lot of difference these days, um, but it makes a few minutes worth of difference as I step up. So, so there's two reasons I decided that try and qualify next year. Firstly, for that reason, to make it maybe give me five more minutes um, in terms of. Uh, uh, qualifying time but secondly the whole sort of journey of being in my 50th year and the achievement and the sort of um, celebrating that fact rather than uh, getting upset with myself the fact that I've gone through a major milestone yeah yeah that, that makes sense so your TEDx talk as you mentioned uh, it's uh, very good and that's one of the main reasons that we're talking and we'll link to that so people can uh, can go and look at it but let's break it down basically because you have this process, uh, an, uh, an acronym for how you want to achieve that goal, which is uh, the acronym is DREAM. So, and the first D, what, what does that stand for? And uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so the, the D stands for DREAM IT. Um, ultimately, um, that's about articulating that plan properly. We, are, we all have lots of dreams, don't we? And uh, uh, we, we, we've all got things that we say, oh, I'd love to do a... I'd love to achieve um, if I, uh, if only I could. Uh, and that's as far as a dream kind of gets from, for a lot of people, kind of they, they talk about it um, uh, socially with their friends about how they'd love to do it. But, and I actually think about how they could actually get there, how they could make that a reality. So, so the dream it part is about articulating that in a much more detail. And now, as I say in the talk, painting every little detail on the canvas uh, and actually drawing a canvas of a of a of a dream is a very good way to uh, to visualize it and bring it to life um but actually you know thinking about how uh how and what we need to do to get there before we actually take any action you know what are the key milestones and things we need to overcome what are likely to be the challenges um i talked in the talk about a chap called jaco otting who i've become quite friendly with now who um uh, is cl- climbed the highest peak in each of the seven continents, including the two Arctic continents. Uh, and that took him 19 years to do that. But um, but what really struck me about Jayco was his attention to detail on the things that could go wrong. Obviously, in in uh, exploring mountaineering, that's life and death, these things that could go wrong. Um, for us, as you know, a, a DNF maybe. I mean, we are, we are at a slight risk of, 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 of injury, of course. We could, we could seriously hurt ourselves on a descent or something. But... As a rule, we're just talking about whether we're going to finish the race or not and in what time, whether we blow ourselves out or not. But for Jayco, that was actually, if I don't make provision for this to go wrong at this point and know what I'm going to do at that moment, I might not come down from the mountain. So so I took really quite a lot about, from him about actually planning for things to go wrong. Uh, so, And then you start to think like that. So as well as planning all the detail of, of kind of like, you know, what my qualifying race is, how quick I need to be, what... Um, where I need to be at my 10k pace, where I need to be at my 10 mile time trial pace, all these kind of things, where my weight needs to be, all these sort of mini goals around the goals. Uh, but also actually, well, actually uh, you start to think more about, well, actually I need to plan for that in case that doesn't happen. Uh, so uh, like planning for more than one qualifying race next year so I can get at least two bites of the cherry if I need it um, is an example. Two, two short follow-up questions here. Do you do you paint the canvas? Do you dream and plan out your qualifying race or actually being in Kona? What what is it at the moment? It's that you're you're painting on your canvas. Both really. I mean, the daily visualization I do, which I'll come to later when we talk about routines, is actually to draw, draw me crossing the line at Kona. You know, so really um, 
so I draw the Kona finish line with my with my wife and family stood beside the line, cheering me on as I go over, and I try and draw the little leaf that you only get at Kona. Um, you know, um, I'm not sure. Did, did, did the winners get those? Does everybody get one? I can't remember. Um, but anyway, I draw this little reef around my neck um, to, to signify it's Kona, and I put the time on the time clock at the top of the, at the top of the finish line. Um, so that for me, on a daily basis, I'm thinking about Kona. Uh, but obviously I've set the goals of where I want to be for the qualifying race because ultimately that it is about that qualifying race because uh, I'm not expecting to go to Kona and, you know, be up there and um, challenging any um, podium places again. Uh, I just want to go there and enjoy the experience. So actually the time is not as important in Kona. Of course, I will go and try and do my very best, uh, but the key is to get around 10 hours for a qualifying race, actually, because that's around about what I'm going to need, um, depending on the um, course. But I'm going to go, uh, I'm pretty certain I'm going to book Denmark as my qualifying race. Uh, sorry, yeah, Copenhagen. So um, uh, that's going to be a quick course because it's flat. So it's going to be 10 hours-ish. Yeah. And, and then the second thing, just a differentiation between dreaming and uh, setting goals how do you look at that since you are talking about dreams here and that's in the acronym so to say but do you, do you think they are can you be used interchangeably or what's your take on it yeah i, I think i think a dream uh, i think somebody famously said a uh, um a dream is a goal without without a plan without, um, without a plan and uh, yeah i forget who said that but um uh, and, and, and I think that's the point and that, you know, that dream it, that bit is about the plan. Um, so I think that what, what that does is, is bridge that gap between that dream, that notion that I'd love to do something and, and an actual way to get there, which is why I can sit there and think, well, actually, I think I can qualify despite the fact that, you know, physiologically, maybe, you know, I, I'm not as strong as some other competitors and, and maybe I will, and maybe I won't, who knows, um, I know, but so, so it re- so it really is like like a goal because you have that plan. Yeah. So it could be dream instead of dream, yeah. but that wouldn't obviously be yeah. <laughs> be as good. Uh, and what, well, I guess okay. what I would probably say is that if I have to stretch, you know, my goal is to get there in my fiftieth year, um, or to qualify in my fiftieth year. So I could technically still be trying to qualify next um, February February two thousand twenty, and I'd still be fifty. So that technically would meet my thing. But actually, if I need to go a year longer because I'm not quite ready. I'm okay with that. I'm okay stretching the dream, mm. um, but as long as I'm still on target to get the dream. Yeah. So the next one, as you already mentioned, routines. What uh, what role do they play for you? So that visualization thing is really important to me every day. I missed when we talked earlier about other other life goals. My my business goal is to energize 10 million people, and with the current um, offer that we're trying to, to um, develop at the moment, I think we we can do that i think we've got a very scalable product um but uh so when i sit down every morning i draw that picture of me uh crossing the line at kona but i also write down energize 10 million people and i draw lots and lots of dots next to it to signify to signify lots and lots and lots of people obviously i don't draw 10 million dots but um but so so i i I kind of that's a routine that I've got every day. Um, I talk in the talk about how Ariana Huffington used that technique to get through her uh, uh, school years and qualify, uh, get enough exams to um, to go to Oxford. And uh, her mother actually took her to Oxford and had her walk the streets and halls so that she could just feel what it felt like to be in Oxford, so she could go home and really believe she was going to Oxford. Um, but the other side of that is sort of really playing into what what I do with clients on a daily basis is, is managing your energy. Um, so within routines, I'm not talking about the stuff you do uh, for the actual uh, goal itself, you know, the, the, the uh, actually delivering on those milestone st- stones that you've come up with in, in dream it. Um, I'm talking about, I'm talking about the things around that. So, and ultimately if we don't actually look after ourselves, we don't, uh, and this is really, really relevant to us athletes. If we're not getting enough sleep, for instance, um that we're gonna we're we're gonna burn ourselves out um so if we're not eating right getting enough sleep looking after our mental well-being doing all these other things so despite this arduous regime i do meditate at least once a day if not twice um i'm uh um obsessive about getting enough sleep in fact i will you know i will um interchange my training sessions in the morning based on 
my sleep pattern. So it's not that I won't do a training session, but I maybe won't do it first thing and maybe won't do two in the morning if I don't feel that I'm fully rested. If I, you know, if I think that extra half an hour to an hour in bed is more important than getting the session done early, then that's what I'll do. How much is enough sleep for you? Eight, eight hours, eight. absolute. Um, and and all the science suggests we all do need at least seven, if not eight. Um, and quite a, unfortunately, as a society, we don't value sleep. We need more because we're athletes and we're you know we're burning the candle at both ends to some extent. We're we're, we're pushing our body physically as well as um, going through all the same mental stuff that everybody else does with life. So uh, I, I can't, you know, out of all the stuff I talk to clients about from an energy management perspective, you know, I, I used to treat sleep as one of the eight tenets that we talk about. I now treat treat sleep as the kind of fundamental building block to everything. Uh, because if, if that's not happening, then nothing else can happen. Yeah. Anything else in uh, the routines, routines department? Well, they were the key ones, really, the daily visualization and, say, making sure you look after yourself. Um, Good. Yeah. Um, which plays into mindset a little bit, which is the last one as well. Yeah. So the next one, E, stands for effort. It does, What's yeah. that about? Well, that, does, that says what it does on the team, really, isn't it? You know, you, you can't expect to, um, uh, you know, achieve great things if you're not prepared to put in great effort, you know. So if, you, if you're not prepared to uh, do that thing every day and – do what's required of you, uh, assuming that you're, you know, you're fit and well enough to do so. Like I just use the example to make sure I get my sleep. It's not that I won't do the session, but I might do it later. Similarly, if you know you're ill, then it's probably not a good idea to go out and do a hard effort session. Uh, um, if, if you know that you're, you're suffering with some sort of cold or something, but, but, you know, putting in that effort. So in the talk, I refer to Michael Phelps and how he, uh, kind of worked five straight years in the run up to the Beijing Olympics. He was a very young man at the time, and uh, I'm not proposing that uh, somebody of my age um, tries to um, put in that kind of effort on a daily basis for five years without a break. But it's a good story of how, because uh, he knew that if he did that, he'd just be putting in, despite the fact that he was an insatiable talent and the kind of a um, physically designed for swimming in terms of his height, etc. Um, and the way his body was made up, um, he knew that by going in and doing more than anybody else, he was going to be better than everybody else. And so I kind of try and take that and I try and think of Michael Phelps when, uh, there are those mornings when you wake up and you're not feeling it. So, and you kind of think, and you, you, you're halfway through a session, you think, oh, I could, especially in the pool, cause swim is my weakest discipline. And you're there and you're done, you're done 1800 meters and you think maybe this is enough. I could stop now. Um, so then that little, then Michael Phelps is just on my shoulder saying, 1800 meters is not going to cut it. You're in the pool now. You're here. Get it done. You know, you plan to do 3000 today. Get it done. Do you have any other tricks? Is it really like having that sort of figure, imaginary figure in your mind that tells you to put in the effort when, when it gets difficult, whether it's, it's, it's getting hard or it's getting long? And, or do you have any other, any other tips for the listeners for how to make sure that they do put in the effort and, and not, not cut it short or, or go easy when they're supposed to go hard. Yeah, I mean, they're, I mean, they're all linked to each other, aren't they? In terms of uh, you know, the visualizations will help with that. If you've done your visualization in the morning before you start your day, then you know that you're trying to get to Kona or whatever your um, visualization might say you want to do, whatever your big goal is. Um, then you're you're more likely to stick to that session already. You've already preconditioned yourself to realize that it's part of a bigger picture rather than just going out and swimming three thousand meters today. Um, but also um, just following from some of the time management and effectiveness tools that I, I, I use with clients is this whole notion of eating a frog, which you may have heard before. Uh, so Brian, Brian yeah. Tracy uh, made that famous way back in the seventies, but there's still such a, such a great little metaphor that people can take forward, you know, and I've actually got, um, I've actually got some Haribo frogs in my office. So if I do a, if I do a great session, whether that's um, training or work, I treat myself to a little Haribo frog, um, afterwards to so for those not familiar uh tell us what what does eating the frog significant uh what is the significance of it yes yeah, so so the notion of eating a frog is is if if you if one of your daily tasks is to eat a live frog uh there's no better time to do that than right now because it's not actually ever going to get any easier to eat that frog so you might as well just get on with it and get it done 
And when you eat it, you'll actually find that it wasn't as bad as you thought it was. And that uh, that's kind of cleared you mentally um, for all the other tasks at hand after it. So, and we all know this from when we do eat a frog, whether that's um, doing that training session first thing in the morning before we start work or um, dealing with that difficult situation at work with a colleague that we've been avoiding. We find that when we do it, we there's kind of a, light, a, a load lifted. Otherwise, we're walking around all day with sort of Damocles over our head, aren't we, saying, um, uh, oh, I must do that session. I must talk to that person, whatever that thing might be. So so just trying to create that habit to eat a frog every day uh, uh, and, and say, for me, the, the little pack bo- box of Haribos up, up in my office is, is the way I do that, you know. So um, so I actually making that connection with uh, a little bit of reward um, to say, yep, you've you've eaten a frog, so therefore you can have a sweet. Mm. That's a, that's a good one. And and I <laughs> my collected data from my athletes back uh, this up, the ones that train first thing in the morning before work, they are so much more consistent. And they, <laughs> for that reason, they end up improving a lot more than those that are habitual, not train in the morning, but train after work persons because they they miss so many more sessions than compared to the morning morning workout people so uh, going on to the second to last uh, part of this uh, acronym a accountability tell us about that yeah so that's that's about working with somebody like yourself michael that's um um that that's um making sure that you are accountable to somebody for whatever it is your goal is somebody is going to um not only, in, I mean, in, in this sense with a, with a coach and an athlete, it's an obvious sense, but, you know, there's lot, lots of stories through history. If you look at any great person in history, you'll find that there was someone stood behind them as a rule. Some Somebody giving them that advice, that support. Uh, I, I used a few examples in the talk. I mean, even Martin Luther King was mentored by Gandhi, which, you know, until I started researching these things, didn't realise, you know, uh, when Richard Branson started out with, uh, Virgin Airlines. He, he he got a lot of advice from the maverick that was Freddie Laker at the time. Um, Mark Zuckerberg was actually mentored by Steve Jobs for 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 much of his early career. All these people, you know, they had they had this support, somebody to go to, and somebody to hold them to account. So, and it, you know, not everybody can afford a coach like yourself. Um, not not everybody can have that. Um, uh, but they can find a way to find to be accountable to someone. There's some. There's usually a family member or somebody that they can kind of have that that conversation with and um, get them to hold them to account, just so that you know you, you're just more likely. I mean, and, and I use this, and and, and peer groups are, are good for this as well. You know, in in our in, in our training in, and coaching, we we use peer to peer accountability as much as we do peer um, individual to coach. So so I just had a conversation this morning with one of my clients about some stuff he's going to do. Um, but I also got him to share it with the rest of his group. There's another five people in his group, which are all different people from different backgrounds. And because he shared it with them and he shared it with me and we've agreed that he's going to do something, he's far more likely to get up tomorrow morning and do that thing than uh, had he had just come up with that notion himself and decided to do it. So that's really about that. Um, some, some people are quite self-accountable, aren't they? But most people aren't. So, so how do you do? Do you have a coach or who, who are you accountable to? Yeah, so in both parts of my life, I've got two JBs. Um, I've got um, I, uh, uh, my triathlon coach is Joe Beer, uh, um, who's been in and around the scene for many, many years. Um, so I had a call with Joe at midday today. I, I speak to Joe every Monday. Uh, um, we we work my training program quite fluidly, so um, we we do each week's program uh, that week based on the previous week. So we. We're constantly iterating that program, which works really well for me. I don't need to be knowing what I'm doing weeks and weeks in advance. Um, I can then sh- sh- slot that around my schedule. But, you know, good conversation because of race week next week. I've got an Ironman on oh, Iron Distance event over the weekend, next weekend. So uh, big conversation about race prep and all these kind of things. That um, And I'm a naturally disorganized person, even though I teach other people about effectiveness. Um, I think that puts me an advantage when teaching others, actually. Um, so, you know, uh, Joe holding me to account to actually write a race plan, actually decide, you know, write down the level of detail of what tire, what pressure I'm putting in my tires and uh, exactly what my nutrition strategy is and all these kind of things are things that I 
possibly would have left a little bit more to chance had I not had that that around me. And then in my business life, there's another JB, a chap called John Burrows, who's my uh, business coach, who similarly holds me to account for uh, what I'm doing with my business. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I, I also, as the listeners know, have a have a triathlon coach, but uh, the listeners probably don't know that I also have a business coach. So, so I absolutely agree 100% with you. And with the peer groups as well, that's something, one of the reasons that I moved to Lisbon in the first place was to get around other fast triathletes and train with people because in Helsinki, there just wasn't that group that could push me. But here I have that group with, with other fast triathletes that, that push me and hold me accountable to train hard put in the effort because if i don't put in the effort if i don't have the right routines they will leave me behind in the dust so so i think this is such an, an important part of of the puzzle i couldn't be more on the same page uh, as uh, of, on on this topic as you would you so anything else we should add to accountability or do we move on to the m no i think that's really it for accountability yeah um i think we cover, m cover it mindset yeah, so I mean, these are all fundamental, but for me, this is the, probably the most fundamental. Um, so this is our ability to kind of overcome them setbacks. Um, so looking at the work of people like Carol Dweck, uh, she talks about growth mindsets a lot. Uh, again, you may may have heard of her. She's an American uh, uh, psychologist. Um, so she talks about the key aspects of uh, what difference is between a positive mindset and a negative mindset. She drew on the reference of. Uh, of kind of like the Borg versus McEnroe battle back in the day. Um, and actually the film came out not that long ago, didn't it? It was an interesting watch after I'd read that book, actually. Um, so, uh, and and sort of describing John McEnroe back in that day, and I think he's grown up a lot since then, um, as the typical fixed mindset person. So, so his sort of uh, uh, behaviour around a longing call, for instance, was all about this fact that he was this precocious talent and therefore, if something went wrong, it couldn't be John McEnroe's fault. It couldn't be the shot that he just played that made that person get a shot perfectly on the line um, to, for him not to be able to return it. It must have been out um, because, you know, he's John McEnroe. So how could he have done it wrong? Because he's the best there is. And and a lot of that is the way, uh, um, certainly in childhood, that's the way that we've spoken to as children to some extent. Um, and there's a lot of schools use growth mindset now as, as, as a teaching methodology to make sure that um, children are nurtured in the right way, that they're given the right encouragement around things like effort, you know, rewarding people for putting the effort in, not for the achievement itself, rewarding around the scene of, of the issue rather than saying, oh, you're brilliant, you are, you, you're really, really good at maths that, you know, uh, so, and I, I use this with my own children, my, my 11 year old stop my aptitude for maths but i try not to tell her she's a genius at maths i try to tell her that she's put in lots of effort and she's done really well um but um you know uh, so that's sort of this sort of difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset person so we can use techniques and tools to nurture that growth mindset to overcome setbacks and look at them saying actually something went wrong what can i do about it so for instance just chatting with joe this morning i took it as a positive that at the end of my I did a full dress rehearsal ride on Saturday, ready for next week race. Not very far, a couple of hours. Um, uh, and I came back and I tried to bump up a little curb outside my house and uh, completely wiped out on my best bike, um, caused a bit of damage to the um, carbon flaring on it. So I was less than pleased, bruised my backside, bruised my arm, a little bit of scraping as well from a little fall. Um but I picked myself up and yes, I was a bit annoyed for a couple of hours. But then I said to Joe, um, what I've taken from that is that's a little real short, sharp sh reminder that because uh, I'm doing a through, through the night race on a, um, it's the midnight man in the UK. So it's a 5.4 mile circuit 20 times. So I said to Joe, I'm really pleased I fell, oh, fell off my bike this week because it's reminded me about focus and attention on the bike and not being complacent when i'm out on that ride that's good yeah and anything else in terms of mindset like do you have any practical tips on how people can uh, can uh, adopt a, a growth mindset or anything else that uh, com goes around this topic i think it's um partly it's about kind of making sure that they they own a situation so looking um making sure that when when 
when you are in the cult because in the in the moment our emotional brain takes over and uh and, and it's quite a powerful beast um and will you know get upset with things and fight flight freeze response will come in and there's all sorts of uh, you know adrenal glands pumping and all these things are going on um but actually when you've got the cold light day afterwards to sit and look at a situation and try and be honest with yourself about um what you did or could do to improve the situation particularly when things go wrong you know what what difference could you make uh, three or four years ago i had a serious cycle crash i was i just finished a hundred mile ride wasn't quite on the hundred so took a detour along the seafront in great yarmouth which was full of tourists and people and uh, i got hit by a car that wasn't my fault i was in a cycle lane the lady came across the cycle lane to get in a car park but i reflected on that situation and thought a I shouldn't have been there. It was a bad place to be. B, it was getting towards the end of the day and it was a bit dusky. I didn't have any lights on my bike um, and I didn't have reflective clothing on. You know, so yes, I could have blamed that lady for everything that went wrong with that day, but actually I needed to inwardly reflect on that. So in the cold light a day after the moment, pulling it apart and thinking, okay, what can I do differently next time to make a difference? Yeah. Because that's where the, that's the gold. That's, that's, that's quite a powerful way to think about it. I like that. Let's start to wrap this up and by first telling people again, what is actually the benefit of, of having this uh, elaborate strategy and uh, all these routines, putting in the effort, the accountability? What, what for you, why do you do it to make sure that people don't miss that part? For me, it's about a holistic approach to, to it so that, um, so that you actually... Uh, got the best chance of success, but also you enjoy it and you live it, you're in the moment with it when you're doing it. You know, um, again, I was talking to Joe this morning about the race and um, one of my clients said to me, um, try and enjoy it if you can. Um, do you do, and then she put, do you, do you enjoy racing? I was like, kind of, well, what would be the point if you don't enjoy it? You know, why, why would you put yourself through that if you don't enjoy it? And I am the guy that is out on the course who uh, people say you're always smiling when you're racing because I love it. Uh, you know, so, so, um, you know, th this whole approach is about not just because you see so many triathletes out there or any kind of um, endurance sport people that are so obsessed with it. They're not even enjoying it anymore. Uh, and they're just singularly obsessed on effort, on putting in the hardest sessions at the hardest times and doing more than everybody else, which is a key component, but they haven't got everything else around it. So for me, this is a It surround yourself with all these other things makes you a more rounded athlete makes you enjoy the experience and i think gives you more uh, more chance of success and finally can you in just one minute one sentence for each each of these uh, five parts to the dream acronym give a practical tip or a next step for the listeners so that they can get started with with applying these things that we've been talking about today yes yeah, so so for dream it i would say um just um draw that picture you know I've, i've got some of my clients do this for non-triathlon goals you know just draw that picture um and draw the detail so so the, the visualization technique i talk about in uh, in routines is slightly different that's a daily thing to get your focus so, so this picture's got everything in it so this is a, a graphical illustration of your goal um broken down Uh, so 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 draw it down on a big as big a sheet of paper as you can get hold of um and and then stick it on the wall uh, and then you can keep tweaking that and changing that um uh, you might want to do it poster notes um uh, just buy decent ones so they don't fall off the wall after three three weeks um and then then and then you can interchange them and, and and change them up but get all that detail down about um you know if you've got specific goals about um other uh distances and um in the other in the individual sports you know what do you want to get your swim time down to what do you want to and, and how are you going to do that what what are you going to do about um transitions where where where's the effort going to be on the bike what, what do you need to do about that and, and what are the goals to get there you know do you need to join your local cycle club or your triathlon club if you haven't done so already uh do you need to get a better bike you need to um lose some weight um i know you talked talked before about weight doesn't too much too much difference on a flat course but um you know wh where are your goals that are going to help you get there so you can segment it down and the more you can segment that down in that dream uh, you you're going to get closer to uh, an actionable plan and then on 
routines. Uh, uh, really, for me, the routines is 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 say that visualization and that energy management. So the and the energy management in particular, um, you know, get you you've, if you've got um, something like a Garmin Phoenix Five phoenix watch you've got kind of the the tracker stuff on it as well but start holding yourself to account for for your sleep in particular um that's the one thing you can do about sleep um so if you haven't got a device that tracks that fitbits do it really well but a lot of athletes haven't got a fitbit because they've got their sports watch but um I, I love my phoenix 5 it's my best ever purchase but um because it does everything i want to do in life um but um you know but you can have a pen and paper beside the bed just just to say oh, i got seven hours sleep last night and it was good sleep i got eight hours sleep and it was it was broken uh, uh and, and and the more you hold yourself to account the sleep in particular which i think is really really important to this particular area the more you will start to um uh change your habit towards sleep and your belief structure towards sleep uh, and then moving on to effort um well, that's just getting out there and get it done, isn't it? You know, and, and, and keeping, like say, have that Michael Phelps on your shoulder. If you can metaphorically have Michael Phelps on your shoulder as a result of listening to this interview, then I've, I've achieved that point, I think. Um, just, um, and, uh, and, a, and a great way to get the effort done is, is partnering. I think, um, uh, not particularly, um, big groups, um, group environments, group, group accountability. We talked about in accountability, but if you've got one buddy that you, um, can commit to that's going to get the earning morning sessions done better than than knowing five or six people are going out because your temptation will be um to say well actually i've they'll be, the other five will be there so i don't need to go whereas if uh if if mark is sitting on the top of the seafront waiting for you at 5 a.m then you better make sure you're there so um so that was that's probably my big tip for effort is find a good trained buddy that um can um make sure that you're you're out yeah that's a good one yeah um and then on uh on accountability the the obvious takeaway is to get a coach if you can afford one but if you can't afford a coach then to find that local group it might be a local triathlon club it might be just a group group of mates that get together sorry about that a group of mates that get together that um uh that are, that you know that that are going to get out and uh, hold each other to account for their actions and finally mindset yeah uh so mindset i think what i talked about earlier really about this overcoming things and really really spending time on honest but constructive self-critique when things go wrong um so um and and really really spend a bit of time thinking about what um what we could do differently to improve things next time because the path is now gone. So, so we need to, we need to kind of put that to bed and not let that affect our future performance. Um, so that, that would be my tip in that area. Yeah. Okay. So let's finish up with some rapid fire questions. And the first one is what's your favorite book, blog or resource related to triathlon? Um, well, I'm going to, go slightly off piste um and say in, in in and say the chimp paradox by professor stephen peters um which i use for triathlon and for my own life as well as my own clients so um a number of your listeners will probably be familiar with this book because um professor stephen peters um is the uh behavioral psychologist behind team sky and british triathlon um, although the book, you wouldn't know that, um, when you're reading the book, um, uh, but this whole notion of the way the brain works, um, the difference between what he calls the chimp human and the computer and how they all play into each other. We really, really, I draw on that book on a daily basis, um, in my life to sort of look at the mindset side of the sport really. Um, uh, and you know, not letting that chimp as he calls it, the emotional part of the brain get out of his cage for too long. And, um, understanding when it does and knowing when to use the human and the computer um, to uh, bring that all back into balance. And what's a personal habit that's helped you achieve success? The visualization that I talked about, um, say 
I use it in more than one thing. There's three things I visualize each day. Um, the two I talked about, plus um, one around family and life, um, I, you know, and that kind of is the, is the is the one daily habit that I always do. And I think it always makes a difference to each day that I set out my intentions for the day. It just sets, it sets my stall out for the day. And what do you wish you had known or wish you had done differently at some point in your journey? Um, I wish I'd have known the 80-20 rule a long time ago. Um, I spent the first few years of my triathlon career um, going out with too many effort sessions at too high a, um, uh, too high a pace um, and causing myself lots of niggly injuries that I didn't, didn't, didn't need to cause um, and not training effectively, being too much in zone zone sort of higher zones than i should have been hmm. so if the listeners want to find out more about you whether it's follow your triathlon progress or maybe looking at the, the things that you're doing with uh, with the energy coaching and uh, the new product that you're coming out your website is yellowbrickroad.co.uk is that right yeah that's that's the website um and uh on twitter on ian.haken um, and there is yellow brick lead on Twitter as well, which is, which is the company's Twitter account. Um, there's not much about the new energy coaching offer out there publicly yet because we're still testing the, uh, the sort of minimal viable product. So, um, but, um, but if anybody's interested in getting involved in that journey and being one of our early customers, um, and, uh, experiencing that, then if they drop me a line on, um, on Twitter or they can email me at ian.haken at yellowbrickroad.co.uk. Um, I'd be delighted to hear from anybody. Brilliant. And uh, I think uh, we'll talk to you again when you qualify for Kona and uh, do the yes. follow up. That will be, that will be yeah, fun. I'd love to do that. Okay, perfect. It was very great talking to you, Ian, and uh, have a nice day. Thanks, Michael. I hope that you enjoyed that interview. I really admire Ian's approach to his big dream and his goal of qualifying for Kona. Just to quickly sum up what DREAM stands for, DREAM IT. And this goes hand in hand really with goal setting because in this case, DREAM come, goes along with having a plan as well, a specific plan to achieve that DREAM and painting the entire canvas as Ian uh, talked about. Then we have routines, including things like sleep, effort. Well, you need to do some hard work for sure. Accountability, having a coach or a peer group and mindset adopting a growth versus a fixed mindset. So the growth mindset is what you want and that will allow you to improve much, much quicker than if you have a fixed mindset. So to check out all the details, as usual, you can find the show notes on thattriathlonshow.com. And uh, since these case studies are still a new format for this podcast, I'm very, very curious what you like about it, what you don't like about it, and uh, how often you would like to hear them, things like that, any feedback that you want to give me. Of course, you can give me any general feedback as well, but for these case studies being a bit newer to the podcast, I really enjoy hearing what you think about them, whether it's good or bad or constructive criticism, things to improve, etc. So send me an email to michael at scientifictriathlon.com to let me know what you think about it. Oh, by the way, one thing that I almost forgot, Ian has, he emailed me, he forgot to mention that he has a free Facebook group called How to Dream Big. I'll link to that in the show notes as well, and you can check it out and learn more about all of these things. Final words about the giveaway that I mentioned before the interview. Again, the URL is scientifictriathlon.com forward slash giveaway, and you can just click the link in the episode description. The main prize for it is a customized 12-week training program that I'll create for you based on your individual needs, a one-hour coaching consultation, a training plan bundle, all the ready-made training plans that I have published so far and all the ones I will publish in the future, six fantastic books for triathletes that are the Triathletes Training Bible, Fast Track Triathlete, How Bad Do You Want It, Triathlon Science, The Art of Running Faster, and Endurance Sports Nutrition, a one-year subscription to Swim Smooth Guru Pro, a one-year subscription to Exert Premium, and uh, precision hydration, electrolytes, and uh, gear uh, as uh, personalized to your individual needs. A couple of runners-up will receive the same training plan bundle, all the plans I have published and will publish, a one-hour consultation with me, and vouchers for precision hydration and Exert, 
and 10 more runner-up prizes will get that same training plan bundle and the precision hydration voucher. So again, check that link, scientifictriathlon.com forward slash giveaway, and uh, good luck. I hope that you win. Big thanks to Roka for sponsoring this episode. You can find them on roka.com, that's R-O-K-A dot com, and you can use the discount code that triathlon show, all one word, all caps, to get 20% off your entire order. And big thanks to Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Take that free online sweat test that I talk about, a free quick quiz that you can take in just a few minutes to get uh, recommendations for electrolytes that will suit your individual needs based on your sweat sodium content and your sweat rate. Use the promo code TTS20, that's TTS20, and that's valid in August only to get 20% off your next hydration order on precisionhydration.com. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.